The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. Sadly, this podcast episode is going to start with a somber and tragic note. This week, our worst nightmare became a reality. It's with broken hearts. We come to terms with the fact that Anton Mzimba, a good friend of mine, a good friend of the team, a mentor and hero to everyone he encountered, is no longer with us. He's the head ranger at Timbavati Private Nature Reserve. He's a technical advisor with Global Conservation Corps and the star of the film I've been working on for over four years now, Rhino Man. So on the evening of July 26, 2022, Anton was brutally murdered in his own home in front of his family. Uh, The police are pursuing the suspects. His wife was also shot during the incident, but is making recovery. And thankfully, the children are all safe. But to say this past week has been heartbreaking is an understatement. With this podcast episode, being about the release of the song Rhino Man, which is an anthem for the rangers, especially those in South Africa that are fighting to protect the rhinos like Anton was. Uh, I feel like it's important to take a moment here and mention Anton's passing. Uh, We're also supporting his legacy and children with a campaign online. You can go to antonzimba.com and donate to the Anton Zimba Education Trust. These funds will go to putting his kids through higher education and supporting youth interested in conservation with their education goals. Anton became a very close friend of mine over the last four years, spent many, many hours with him out in the bush, working on the film, just having conversations in his truck, or Bucky as they say in South Africa, and getting very close trying to support him through his work, getting lots of words of encouragement from him over the years to keep pushing, to tell his story, to tell the story of the Rangers, and to make sure the world knows about this cause and heartbreaking war that's going on over the rhinos. So you can find out more online on our social media. Uh, We've posted a lot about Anton in the last few days. Sorry to have to start this episode off like this, but I couldn't do it without mentioning my good friend Anton. So let's do what we can to honor Anton's legacy and to support the Rangers all around the world. And after listening to this episode, make sure to listen to the song Rhino Man, available now on all streaming platforms. Now let's get back to the regular recording. In this episode, I'm talking with Paul Lindenberg. Paul is a singer-songwriter who grew up in South Africa during apartheid. He served in the military and became part of the band, performing for soldiers deployed to the border war. He eventually made his way to Italy, where his musical career grew. He performed regularly and recorded songs for Polydor Records, some of which are now being re-released through Underflow Records. This is a very special conversation because Paul is the father of Matt Lindenberg, my good friend and the founder and executive director of the Global Conservation Corps. Paul's newly released song, Rhino Man, was the inspiration for the title of our film and is an ode to the rangers who put their lives on the line to protect the rhinos. In this chat, we discuss Paul's early days growing up, his relationship with music, his time in the military, and his desire to see the world. We talk about his musical process and how he became connected to conservation. We dive into the development of the song Rhino Man and how that name, along with Matt's passion for conservation, sparked a movement. Paul even gives us an acoustic taste of Rhino Man at the end of the episode. So make sure to listen to the end and then go to Spotify or Apple Music to hear the fully produced release. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Paul Lindenberg. All right, Paul, welcome to the Rhino Man podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on here. Thank you very much, John. Great to be here. Yeah, it's pretty awesome to be having this conversation with you. I mean, the Rhino Man podcast, the name Rhino Man is something that, yeah, has come from a story of one of your projects (laughs) that started some years ago at this point. And, you know, my connection to you is through your son, Matt Lindenberg, and we've become really great friends over this project, Rhino Man the Movie. And I think the first time I met you was in 2019 at the 
the Rhino Arts District screening that we did of Rhino Man. That was in Denver, right? Yeah, that was in Denver. And you played the song Rhino Man before the screening of the film, which was really amazing to see, an acoustic version of that. And so, yeah, we're here to kind of celebrate the release of the song, the single, and talk about your history in music conservation and how this all kind of came about. Yeah, well, John, again, thanks very much for having me on your podcast. And yeah, it's great to be here and to see all of this beginning to come full circle is really wonderful. It's been quite a journey. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. And we're really going to dig into your musical history and leading up to the song and how that all came about. But quickly, before we kind of dive into all of that, can you give us the specifics on the release of the song and some of the things that you're doing that people can check out now? Sure. Well, the song is, you know, the recording's been completed and it's going to, uh, as far as I know, go out on, you know, all of the new types of, of release mediums, like all the streaming platforms, Spotify and uh, all those platforms. Yeah. And I believe when this podcast comes out, it should be available already. So hopefully people can go check it out right after this episode. And Great. Uh, you're also going to perform a, a acoustic version of some of the song at the end of this podcast. So everyone stay tuned sure. for that as well. I think that'll be really cool. Yeah, that'll be great. So let's dive into some of your history. Can you talk about what it was like growing up in South Africa and some of your early days? I don't know if there were early on any connections to music or wildlife or what that experience was like, but yeah, I'd love to hear how it all. Very good question. Um, so from the standpoint of music, very briefly, I, I always loved music. I remember at school, uh, we had a music class, but it was only once a week. This was in, you know, in the grades. And I would always ask the teacher after the, the, the singing lesson, you know, with the whole class, I would stay behind and ask her if I could, you know, sing another extra one or two songs just because I really, you know, enjoyed doing that. And then when I was about, I think, 13 or 14, and we were on a family vacation on the wild coast of Southern Africa, a beautiful place called Mazeppa Bay. And there was a visiting musician. And one evening in the family pub, he performed some songs with his guitar and very much in the style of Gordon Lightfoot. And I just, I, I was just totally riveted by that and just thought, oh, wow, isn't that something? And about a, within maybe six months or so, I had managed to convince my parents that I, I needed a guitar and some guitar lessons. And so, so that kind of got me going on the guitar. How old were you at that point when you saw that person perform? I was 13 or 14. But I never really got into guitar as a, as a serious you know, player. I mean, I played enough to be able to sing along with you know, the guitar. But it was only many years later that uh, once I was in Italy and I actually had a small band and one guitarist was uh, outstanding, a guy from Sardinia. And he, he taught me quite a bit, which you know, helped me then develop my songs in a, in a more professional way. But the music bug, I think it got into me quite young. My mum was a, a great singer, not professionally, but she was trained and she would sing at weddings and you know functions. And then at various family get-togethers, my grand would play this lovely baby grand piano and sing. She also had a magnificent voice. And to hear them singing and, you know, the the, the lovely sort of background music going on, it was very much a part of growing up. And yeah, I always, always enjoyed being part of that. Do you remember some of your early influences in your early teens once you started getting into singing and playing guitar a little bit yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Simon Garfunkel, uh, Cat Stevens, Jim Croce, Neil Young, Sills Nash. I could go on and on. John Denver. Obviously, the Beatles to some degree, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. Did you start learning some of their songs? Is that kind of how you... Yes, definitely. Uh, Don McLean was another one. So yes, I, I basically just developed my playing by trying to emulate some of these singers. And then in high school, had a, a little band, which was really just a, a great excuse to get together with some of my good mates. 
And we all fancied ourselves as rock stars, and none of us could really play very well. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. I think we had about four songs in our repertoire, and then we'd have to start repeating, you know. So <laughs> we didn't have a huge following, and we didn't make any records. But we had a lot of fun. And, you know, the, the musical journey continued in various interesting ways. But maybe before I get into that, I, I should give... A, a little bit of background into the South African situation because yeah, that'd be great. It's very different today. There were there were two big shadows, if 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 I could call them that, when I was growing up, when my generation was was growing up. The two big shadows. The first, the most obvious to most people, would be the apartheid one, and that was something that was implemented from 1948. And it was only finally dismantled in the early 90s. So for all those years, there was this increasingly dark and sinister shadow that permeated across the spectrum. And, you know, initially, I think, certainly growing up, what do kids know? What are you, you know, what are you really aware of? But as one got older, it started to become more and more, more apparent that, you know, this wasn't kind of normal, where there had to be this separation where people were being discriminated against because of the color of their skin. And, you know, I was at a private school. I was very fortunate. And we at some point, uh, or the school, took in black children as well. It was marginal, but nonetheless... The school itself, it was a Catholic school, had tremendous pressure from local authorities because this was not in keeping with the sort of government policy. And that's just one, one small example of, of how this awareness began to develop. Where were you living at that time? Were you in the Joburg area? In Johannesburg, yes. Grew up in, the, in one of the suburbs. And was sort of surrounded by this cosmopolitan or sub suburban lifestyle, but where the, there was this sort of clear line of, of separation between races. And the lengths that the government went to became more and more sinister. There was a lot of control on the media, on news pertaining to events. And it became more and more apparent when, for example, we became isolated in terms of our sport sanctions, boycotts. We were not sure of the date, but I think it was around 1960 that South Africa was, was no longer allowed to compete in the Olympics. So there was a lot of outside pressure from the Western world to... Yes, and it increased, and rightly so. Uh, but the government dug its heels in and was able to hold on to power by virtue of the white vote by a very small margin, but they nonetheless were able to hold on to that power. So, you know, I think in, in fairness to, to a lot of the people who still voted just because they were white didn't mean that they necessarily agreed with what was going on. It was a long, hard road to get things to change. However, the whites still had many advantages, or should I say all the advantages, of living in the country while the blacks didn't. So it wasn't as urgent for them. So I think the external political pressure, international uh, political pressure, certainly helped to move things, uh, you know, to bring things to a head. And it could have been a very nasty head. It could have been a full-out civil war if it hadn't been for the likes of two men in particular that, that come to mind, and those were Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk, white and black leaders, respectively, who recognized the vital need for constructive engagement and, and change, and were able to steer the electorate and the uh, black majority in a, in a constructive way. But it took a lot of very courageous leadership on their part, and on the part of many people. Um, and it was, I think, in 1990 or thereabouts, or 1989 perhaps, that F.W. de Klerk held a referendum for the white electorate and got a two-thirds majority, which he needed to set in motion the bringing about of an end to, to the apartheid regime, which then you know, transpired in 91, 
through 94, and, and then Nelson Mandela got elected to power. So that's almost 30 years ago. So, yeah, a lot has happened, but, but the scars, a lot of the damage, it's, it's still evident. And whites and blacks still are, are paying a heavy price for, for those terrible years of, of apartheid, or those terrible policies. So anyway, that was one of the two components of uh, growing up in, in South Africa. It was only when I was in, in my, I was 21 when I left South Africa to go to Europe to see what was in the rest of the world because we were very isolated. And it became even more apparent, you know, just how heinous this whole regime was. And that was in the 80s when you left, somewhere around there? It was 1982. 82, yeah. 1982. And I had just come out of my two years of conscription with another two years to go in the form of compulsory camps, they call them. Which was mandatory for... Mandatory for white males up to... Uh, so a total of four years was your, was your requirement at that time. It had been steadily increasing over the years, but that was when things were, were really quite, quite bad. Did you face any combat or anything during that time? Because there were some, what, border wars? I was in red zones, they called them. So here's, here's a little digression, if you will. I, I mentioned that there were these two shadows that we grew up with, the one being the apartheid. The other was the border war. The Angolan War, whatever you want to call it, it was a war that was that started around 1960 and only came to an end towards the late 80s. And that was a, an asymmetric war being fought between proponents of a certain regime, uh, the Soviet regime or Marxist regime in Angola and Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. And it was a guerrilla war, basically. So growing up, you know, in school, you knew that when you either left school or university, you were going to go to the military, whether you whether you liked it or not. And when I left school at the age of 17, I opted to go to university. And after a few weeks, it was just clear to me that, A, I wasn't convinced about my academic path. And B, I knew that sooner or later I had to go and do this similar training. And the way things were going in the country, I was concerned that if I waited any longer, that conscription period might be even longer. So I just wanted to get that duty, if you will, out of the way. So once that was done after two years, I worked for about a year, saved up enough and got a plane and went to Europe to go and uh, see what was in the rest of the world. So before you left for Europe and you were, you know, you were in bands, really into music, were any of those artists, did you connect to any of them because of maybe some of the, you know, I feel like Neil Young is very socially active when it comes to things mm -hmm. like that. So I don't know if there were, was any of that a part of your musical experience, kind of thinking about the issues that you were facing in South Africa? Yeah, very much so. The, the character that comes to mind there was a guy by the name of Rodriguez. And there's a wonderful documentary on, on his life and, and music called uh, Searching for Sugar Man or Finding Sugar Man. And that's, that I would highly recommend that to anyone interested in either music or South African history or the music industry and bootlegging and all that good stuff. But yes, there were, there were musicians, people who you know, were having lots to say. Uh, Paul Simon was another one. And they came under tremendous pressure too to not be allowed to perform in South Africa or they, you know, they had, they paid consequences. They were blacklisted and things like that. But there were those musicians who felt, hey, I can do more with my music by raising awareness and, 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 and trying to help people understand what's really going on and what needs to be done. So yes, they certainly had my attention and, and my admiration. Did you think that music could be a path at all when you were in high school before you went to Europe? Well, I, I like to think so, but deep down I knew I wasn't going to, you know, make it my life. At that time, it was a means to, to explore the world, to travel. I, you know, was able to make a living uh, singing, and, and I continued with my songwriting, or began to develop my songwriting, but I needed a work permit to be able to stay in Europe for any length of time. And lo and behold, someone came to a venue where I was singing and they met, he and an associate met with me afterwards and 
offered me a recording contract right there and then. And they were a Milan-based company. How long were you in Italy at that point? Been there for a couple of years. Uh, maybe I was into my second year. So I was kind of ducking and diving in terms of, you know, being able to stay for any length of time. I had to go to Switzerland to get my visa renewed to come back into Italy on a fairly regular basis. So I got to know the, the route between Milan and I think it was Bern or something quite, quite well. So once I had that recording contract, they wanted to get me to do a lot of commercial music, which wasn't my thing. I was more into the, you know, the folk and the singer songwriter type of deal. But I did. I made a couple of records and did some, you know, big concerts, some of the precursors to the Eurovision. They have one in Italy called Sanremo, which is a big, you know, song festival. And I was in the precursor to the Sanremo one. I never got that far, but I'd had a lot of fun on the way, you know, playing in front of big crowds and kind of getting the feel of what it would be like to, you know, to, to be a, a rock star. But I, I was never comfortable in that situation. I felt like an idiot on the stage trying to look cool and do a Michael Jackson thing. <laughs> that wasn't me at all. It just wasn't me. I was far more comfortable, you know, on, on, a, on a small stage with my guitar um, maybe a couple other musicians with me and just doing, doing a different genre altogether. So I feel like there's a lot that happened in that period. So you went mm -hmm. to, did you go to Italy originally? Was there a reason you went there or did you jump around Europe at all? What was the travel experience like? Actually, I had decided I was going to come to the States back then. But because of all the sanctions and, uh, you know, embargoes and things. South African Airways was not allowed to fly directly between either um, South Africa and the U.S. or South Africa and Europe. I mean, they, they could eventually because Boeing developed a, a long-range jumbo jet that was able to fly around the bulge of Africa. So we would do a, I think it was a straight 14 or 15-hour flight, which meant, you know, we, we wouldn't fly directly over the continent of Africa. And that was how they got around that problem. So for me to get to the States, I would need to have flown from Johannesburg up into Europe and then get a connecting flight from Europe across to the States. And at the time, I had found out through one of my uncles that we had some distant relatives in the States. My plan was then to go to Europe and you know, get across to these relatives that had since you know, invited me and so on. But along the way, and this was still in South Africa, I'd met up with some Italian friends, and uh, they were scholarship students, and they were vacationing at some of their, for some of that time. And that's when, so when I met up with them, they told me they'd never been to the Kruger Park. And I had never been to the Kruger Park at the age of 19 or something. I think I was still finishing up my army training, but I was on a, a, a vacation, and I offered to take them into Kruger. So we established the sort of friendship. And then sometime later, once I was then free, you know, done with the army and ready to travel, they said, well, if you're coming through Europe, you're welcome to come and stay with us. And so that was the plan. So I got to Europe or Italy and within a couple of weeks had been offered a job singing and it led to a, another job and a, a, a TV show and another job and, you know, so on and so forth. And I never got to the States at that point. Landed up staying in Europe for about seven years, even though I would go home about every year or sometimes two years to visit my family. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you were in Italy and you started doing some more work as a musician and a singer and songwriter, what was that journey like? As you said, you, were, you started developing your writing skills more. I think you, had some, you said you had some connections with some other people that maybe were a part of your, one of your bands. Describe how that developed and maybe even the, it sounds like there was like a little bit of a tension between the commercial work that you were doing to make money, but then also some of the stuff that you were more passionate about. I don't know if you were writing both at the same time or trying to, or how that all came about. Well, after about four years of, you know, this music, doing gigs, travel, I think some of the shine wore off. And I began to feel like I needed to get back to something more academic and went back to studying uh, correspondence through a university in South Africa and realized that I needed to have a more regular type of lifestyle. 
So I got a job as an English teacher in Bologna. It was a Swiss language institute based around Europe, but they had an office in Bologna. And I was able to get a job there. And I really kind of got away from the music for a while just because I was working and studying. And But it was, I think, during that time that I was becoming more and more aware of some of the the, the realities of, of what was going on in South Africa and how things were looking and where things were headed. And it was a, it was a big worry, even though I didn't have any children. You know, I didn't have my children at the time. But I didn't see myself living in South Africa permanently or, you know, going forward. I've always, always loved the country, and I'm, I feel as South African as I do American, if not even more in many ways. Just because that's where I'm from, you know, I have African roots. Um, I'm probably third, third, fourth generation. And so that's, you know, my early formation is, is African. And I strongly identify with that still. But I've also, I think, and, and during my time in Italy, in those subsequent years, began to realize that, you know, we, we ultimately all citizens of the world. And when we begin to identify too strongly with something, it, it can lead to problems, particularly when we're not willing to share that identity with other people or other groups. And so it was an interesting time in, in terms of how my, my worldview began to expand and change. And I had done various you know, courses and, and avenues of interest at, at whether it was, you know, something to do with philosophy or maybe a little bit of psychology or sociology and, and just picking things up along the way that, that I, I found extremely interesting and, and educational in many ways. So from there, did you start, did you eventually get back to writing? You said you stepped away for a while as you were doing these studies. Correct. Did you then incorporate some of the, what you were learning and what you were thinking about when it came to South Africa into some of the songs that you wrote subsequently? Well, yeah. So one of the early songs I wrote was called The Champagne Generals. It was really about this frustration that I had with, you know, from where I was at when I was in infantry, thinking about, you know, how nice it was for these generals because they sat around these beautiful tables and attended cocktail parties and, you know, traveled first class everywhere. But we were doing all the dirty work. So anyway, that, that was just one of those digs that I try to take using my music. I wrote quite a lot about nature, and some of that came, you know, from the experiences that I'd had, obviously, in, in South Africa. Yeah, I remember listening to uh, Ever Golden recently, and just, uh, I mean, it seems like that's written from the perspective of an eagle flying through the skies. So, I mean, it's, I feel like it connects to that, maybe that freedom of travel that you have too, but also just the, the spirit of the wildlife. I think having seen some of those beautiful birds in, in South Africa, as, as you have experienced, um, they are very unique and, and, and very inspiring. I think I was in the military still and in, you know, in basic training when I saw an eagle in, in the part of the world, which is actually very close to Kruger. And I'm not sure what type of eagle it was. Matt would know. But I just remember looking up and seeing this beautiful raptor high up in the sky, totally free, doing its thing, and wishing for that kind of freedom, longing for that type of freedom. And so, you know, not having had the freedom that I perhaps had been used to and was now becoming a, a young man and, and, and just wanted to be able to do my own thing, um, yeah, I, I identified pretty strongly with that. And so it, it found its way into a song. How much longer did you spend in Italy before you decided you were going to head back to South Africa? I was in Italy till 1988. Got married in May, was there for another four or five months, and then we went back to South Africa to start a family. And I think, from my standpoint anyway, to, to reinvigorate what I think I had lost in terms of my hope for the country, my optimism. So, yeah, went back to South Africa in 1988, and it was quite a tough transition going back, knowing that I was still eligible for military camps. And within a year, they, they had me 
signed up and ready, ready to go to a camp. Within about two weeks after that meeting, we were supposed to head up to the border. And I just couldn't believe here I was wearing a uniform again and totally not wanting to be there. And fortuitously, I think about a week before we were supposed to head out, uh, it got cancelled because by then all these machinations were going on and uh, Nelson Mandela was about to be released from prison and the, the border war, you know, the, the countries involved had come to various agreements, ceasefires, whatever you want to call them. And so that was the end of, of any military involvement for me. Thank heavens. Yeah, so I imagine that was a sigh of relief when that happened. Huh? Particularly given that, that I, at that point, you know, Matt and his sister Jess were babies. Well, no, Jess wasn't mm-hmm. around yet, but, you know, it, it, it was around that time. Yeah, you had a family to worry about on top of just going through that process. Some years later, some years later, yeah, Matt was, I think, nine or ten when we moved down near Kruger. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about your connection to conservation and even, I know Matt's told me a lot of stories about you guys going into reserves and Kruger and that really influenced him. So I'm just curious from your your side, what some of those adventures were like taking the kids there and experiencing the wildlife and what memories you have. Well, we made the decision to get out of Johannesburg towards the end of the 80s. No, I beg your pardon. I'm totally wrong. Towards the end of the 90s. It would have been 97 thereabouts, maybe, nine, yeah, 97. Things had really gotten bad in Johannesburg, in South Africa in general, uh, particularly in the cities with crime and violence and so on. And we just had been thinking about, you know, getting into a, a, a more conducive environment, a safer environment. So we sold everything up. I had a furniture business at the time, furniture manufacturing, and we purchased a guest house in, in the town of Sabi. It's about an hour from Kruger, maybe a a little less. Anyway, so we were there for about three years. During that time, one of the things I did was I did a a certification in being a tour guide so that I could officially advertise being able to take people into the Kruger Park. And whenever Matt could, he would tag along. Mm. And it was always wonderful to have him with me. (laughs) <laughs> we also did a fair bit of trout fishing in the area we lived. It, it was quite a bit of that, which was always fun. And a lot of off-road cycling and waterfalls and just really being very close to nature. It was it was quite wonderful. Um, I'm sure Matt shared with you uh, one of our river rafting or river canoeing trips where I nearly got us both taken out. Mm, I don't think I've heard that story. <laughs> He's probably trying to save my reputation. but. It was, it was just one of those, you know, crazy things and live to tell the tale. But by and large, it was absolutely, an absolutely beautiful part of the country. I, I distinctly remember many occasions, but in this one where Matt and I were on the side of, of the Sabi River and we were watching a kingfisher go from branch to branch across this river fishing and just how absolutely elated Matt was. His, his whole persona was just <laughs> surrounded in light. He, he, was, he was just, you know, he loved it and he spoke about it. I'm sure he remembers that too, that uh, he spoke about it for months afterwards. And he would always get so enthusiastic mm-hmm. and excited about anything that he saw for the first time. He could identify birds from, uh, I could barely see them and he would know exactly what they were. And there was a bird of prey center not far from us and they would rehabilitate um, injured birds of prey. And we would go there sometimes. And, you know, for Matt, that was always a a big highlight. Do you remember what the, because we're going to get there pretty soon, I think, the rhino situation was at the time. I know, like, the the recent poaching crisis really took off in 2008, somewhere around there. But were there any concerns at that time? for rhinos or any other wildlife? Was poaching a serious thing to worry about other than maybe some subsistence here and there? Do you, I don't know if you knew much about it at the time or were following it. To be honest, I do not recall there being any poaching epidemic. There were isolated cases of whether it was a rhino or an elephant or one of the animals being poached. But for one thing, we were not, you know, there was no social media and 
we were about an hour from Kruger. It was really very seldom that anything like that would make the news. Um, obviously, if it did, if it did, it, it was of concern to people, but it was never. There was never enough of it to, to you know, that anyone really uh, that it was considered a problem. Yeah. Do you have any other memories that stand out from those days of you guys going into some of these parks and seeing the wildlife? Um, well, I think any time you know you sight a leopard for the first time or or a cheetah. We were on a night drive once and. We had a tremendous ranger with us, and he, not sure for what reason, but he just knew he needed to stop next to this tree, and we were told to put on our flashlights, and just down off to the side was a, mm. was a leopard in the grass. And, you know, when you get up clo that close to one of those beautiful animals, uh, whether it's for the first time or the tenth mm. time, it always takes your breath away. There's something so magnificent and, and beautiful about these animals. And unfortunately, you know, when you go and, and, and see these animals in a zoo, even though you can appreciate so much, yeah. it's not the same. It's not the same as seeing them in their natural environment. But zoos certainly have a, a role to play, and I'm, I'm all for them. But having grown up in, in the city and, and seen my first animals in the zoo, which I think in many ways helped me appreciate seeing them in, in their natural environment, I would always prefer to see them in their natural environment if, if I had that option. I know you said the first time you went to Kruger was with your Italian friends. What was that experience like? Was that the first time you saw wildlife in the wild? No, I'd been into a, into a national park. It wasn't Kruger. It was um, Kuzi National Park, and that's mm -hmm. in Natal, a different province. And in fact, I had two amazing encounters with rhino. In, in that, on that, I was a, I was still in school. I was in high school. It was a leadership trail. There were four of us students and two teachers, and we went on a. It was a walking trail with a game ranger and a game guard, and we slept in the park for two or three nights. So we did these daily <laughs> trails on foot with the rangers, and Mkuzi, certainly at the time, mm. it did not have any lion or big cats. So, but, you know, obviously rhino, elephant, you mm -hmm. still had to know, you know, what you were doing and be safe. The first encounter I had with the rhino was when the ranger told us all to quiet down and to stop. And he pointed, and in the distance, there was a, a black rhino. And when I say in the distance, it mm -hmm. might have been half a kilometer away. And he said, we just need to be cautious because it, he looks, it looks like a male. And he's, you know, he's, we are in his territory. And then he told us, you know, they, they don't have great eyesight, but they've got a very good sense of smell and obviously, you know, good hearing. So let's try and be discreet. And we need to sort of stay in single fire. But if I tell you to, I want you to spread out and make as much noise as you can. <laughs> so we said, okay, that's no problem. Of course, you know, mm -hmm. at 16 or 17, you're invincible, right? So we began to walk fairly, you know, maybe at 45 degrees to him. So we were getting a little closer, and this rhino turned and snorted, and we all stopped again, and he you know, thumped his feet on the ground, began to raise up dust, and then he looked up. And I think we, we had the wind in our favor, but I think the wind must have shifted because suddenly he kind of <laughs> really honed in on us. And so we were told to spread up and make a heck of a noise. That didn't deter him. He took a few steps closer, and now he was really, you know, stamping, and he actually mm -hmm. sprayed. They spray when they let, letting you know they, they mean business. So at that point, the ranger said, look, the best thing is to get up a tree. Well, there weren't too many trees close by, and I seem to recall that, you know, four of us were all running for the same bush at the same time, wondering who was. <laughs> anyway, fortunately, at that point, I think he decided he had – given his best bluster, and he, he didn't go through with his, his charge. Mm. So we were very relieved. Later that day, or maybe even the next day, we were at a different part of the park on foot, walking in single file, probably four or five meters between us each. And I came around this little thicket of, of bush, and within arm's length, a white rhino female walked right in front of me. Wow. And 
I had not seen that the calf was just ahead of her. And you, you yeah. know, at that point I turned and there was the calf. She was, she was walking, you know, behind the calf. And that was another breathtaking moment because here I was, you know, I could almost have touched her, but she wasn't worried by me. She was just, she had yeah. her eyes on her calf and she just kept going. And the, the white rhino is the bigger of the two. But what a beautiful sight wow. and uh, experience. Yeah, that's an amazing experience. And yeah, for those that don't know, the black rhinos are known for charging quite often if you get in the wrong place in front of them, mm -hmm. whereas the white rhinos typically just run off and are a little more skittish. Yeah. So you kind of lucked out there. <laughs> Good thing that wasn't a black rhino that was an arm length. Yeah, away. yeah. or a black mamba. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, that's an amazing experience. So at this time, back in South Africa, were you still, maybe even just more for yourself, were you still playing music? Were you still writing at all? Did you kind of keep that up off and on over the years? No, not very much. Not very much. You know, it was a, at that point, it was, it was a hobby. And I, you know, would, would play for the kids sometimes and just for, for friends from time to time. But yeah, for quite a few years, I, I, mm -hmm. you know, I was just so busy with other things that I didn't really... I didn't have the time or the energy to focus on, on music specifically. But I just, you know, I, I dabbled in it and I, I, I try to keep it fairly current. Do you have anything else you want to talk about kind of leading up to this point before we move on to kind of the origins of the song Rhino Man? Because I feel like that's kind of a story in itself. But I don't know if there's anything else from growing up or your early days of music that we didn't get to chat about that you want to bring up before we move on. Yes. So... When I was in the military, we start out doing a three-month basic training course, and then that's called the first phase, and and then you go into second phase, and then at that point, if they feel you you know you need to go and specialize in something or go on an officer's mm -hmm. training course, that's when all that happens. And I think it was during the second phase, early into the second phase, that I injured my back and was going for um, medical treatment at the military hospital in Pretoria, which is a good few hours from where our infantry camp or base was. How'd you injure it? It was an old injury that flared up, and they reckon it was just from all the, the marching, you know, and carrying heavy, heavy weights. So I was sent to go and get physical therapy. While I was there for these two weeks to go in, you know, every day for therapy, I was allowed to stay. I, I could either stay, you know, at the hospital where they had facilities, you know, for outpatients, or I could stay at home. Well, obviously, it was only an hour away from, from home, so I was happy to be able, able to stay home. And they had a, a system back in the day where military personnel, if they needed to get from one place to another, we weren't allowed to hitchhike. But they had these designated areas where you could stand on the side of the road in your uniform, and if a passerby wanted to give you a ride, they would just pull up and you'd jump in and they would mm -hmm. give you a ride to you know the next town or wherever you were going, if it was on their way. So my dad would drop me at the highway on his way to work. And at the highway entrance, there was a, a designated waiting zone. And, you know, people were very good about giving you rides. And usually within five minutes, someone stopped. So on this particular occasion, a lady pulled over offered me a ride, I jumped in, and within a couple of minutes of chatting, she told me that her husband was in the permanent force and he was in hmm. the uh, orchestra, in the South African Entertainment Corps, the South African Defense Force Entertainment Corps, that had a main orchestra, and then they had a number of smaller bands that would go and perform up on the frontier yeah. and do you know, border shows, boost morale, raise money at different shows around the country and, you know, for uh, veterans and things like that. So I said, oh, gee, that's, that's very nice. She said, yeah, he's, he's permanent force. He, he plays, I think it was the saxophone. And uh, she was on her way to fetch him. And the military hospital happened to be right next to the base of the uh, entertainment core unit. And along the way, um, I told her that, you know, I had an interest in music. And uh, she said, well, you know, they're always looking for talent. And um, I could speak to my husband and see if, you know, they could maybe give you a, an interview. Sure enough, that evening, her husband called me and said, you know, my, my wife told me about you. And if you like, you can come with me, you know, tomorrow. I'll set up a, a meeting. And um, so I 
got there, did my interview, played a couple songs, and the major said, great, you know, I'll sign the paperwork. When you've done with your rehabilitation, go back to your base camp, and these are your transfer papers. Well, I thought I had yeah. just died and gone to heaven. This was just fantastic. So for the remainder of my military service, I was put in a, a small band, and I used to go and do, you know, border tours. Where they'd fly us up in, you know, military aircraft up to Namibia, north of Namibia, actually, right on the Angolan border. It was a stretch of land known as the Caprivi Strip, and they were all big military bases along that area, on Dangwa, Rundu, Ruakana. These are some of the names that, that come to mind. And a lot of these were just dirt airstrips. And I had some very interesting experiences flying in and out of there because, you know, you're in a big airplane, you're a target. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to bore everyone with those stories, but you knew, let's just put it this way, you knew there was a war going on. But it was, it was quite an experience being up, playing to the troops, sometimes a thousand, you know, huge hangar, uh, guys that hadn't been home for months. And they were hundreds of miles yeah. from home. You know, this was at the top of Namibia, which is the size of Mexico. And sometimes after a show, some of the guys that had trained with me would come backstage and, hey, Paul, how's it going? You know, we haven't seen you for so long. And how did you do this? You know, what happened? How did you get so lucky? And I said, well, obviously, yes, I'm very blessed because things worked out. That's an amazing experience. What was it like for, you know, playing in front of those guys, especially, you know, you said they're away for so long. And I mean, this is... It was fantastic. It was because I had kind of been one of them, yeah. for, even though, you know, for a fairly short period of time. But these were my buddies, you know, and I was able to, I think, make them feel better. I was playing them songs that they really liked. Not my songs, you know, songs of guys mm -hmm. like, I don't know, Eric Clapton. Yeah, yeah. Cocaine, that was a big hit at the time. And, you know, you'd start playing that song and, and <laughs> the guys would just erupt because it made them feel so, I don't know, hopeful. It, it, it took away some of that pain they were feeling. So, yeah, it was it was. Very interesting, that whole experience a um, long time ago. Do you have uh, maybe one of the memories of, it sounds like you were shot at while you were in that airplane. I mean, was, was there kind of maybe a first time even where? No, fortunately, okay. I was never shot at. But on one, one occasion, we were taking off. This is on a dirt runway. Very, very hot as it does get up there. Extremely hot. So your lift cap capability in an airplane, you know, decreases. So you need as you need all the runway and power you can get. And we had that trip. We were on a, a DC four, a big four engined Skymaster, we called it. And it would have to fly treetop mm -hmm. level because if you were, you know, higher up, you're easier to spot and shoot at. So by being a treetop top level, you might hear a plane coming, but by the time you saw it, it was you know over you and gone. Anyway, just after takeoff, and this is after a heavy previous night, you know, we had a brewery that sponsored all our trips. So <laughs> there was always plenty of beer and, and cigarettes and lots of heat and mosquitoes. And you're feeling, feeling pretty rough the next morning. And you're sitting in this plane, revving up, really revving up. Hot as all get out. And the plane, you know, releases its brakes, flying down the runway. And maybe 100 feet up in the air, we hear this explosion. Our biggest fear was, you know, taking off and landing because that's where you were a real target. And there was this explosion and this shudder, and straight away we thought we'd been hit by one of the um, heat-seeking shoulder launch uh, missiles they would use. The next thing, the cockpit door flies open, the flight engineer comes running out, and he looks out left window, right window, and he runs back into the cockpit, and then he comes back out again and he says, crash positions. And we thought, we've been hit. In the meantime, the plane is, you know, turning and losing a bit of altitude and making that mm. horrible sound, you know, <laughs> when they change speed and everything. We, we were told to brace. And at the last minute, the pilot, you know, corrected. He feathered the prop on the engine that had blown. That's all that, that had happened. We hadn't been shot at. One of the engines had blown, the cylinder had blown. But at that point, we couldn't fly at treetop level. So we climbed up to 10,000 feet. You know, it wasn't a pressurized plane. So that was as high as we could fly. When we got to the next airbase, which was, I think, a, an important one, 
It was on Dangwa, which was a big sort of seat of operations. We couldn't fly, we couldn't start our descent from, you know, 10 miles out or whatever. We came in over the airfield at 10,000 feet, and then we did a box mm. descent, and they sent up three or four Puma helicopters to cover us wow. with the big Brownings mounted in the, in the door, you know, on the sliding door that would open, and we would, those mm-hmm. were called gunships. But that was quite an experience, you know, because there you are coming down, and you see these choppers, you know, yeah. you're going by them pretty close, and they're just waiting to, you know, for something to light up on the, on the felt, and then they'll, you know, go in and cover us. So, you know, experiences like that really stay with you. Yeah, I can imagine. Times when you, you'd, you'd land and the plane would taxi you right up to a, almost like a, a bunker and you would get straight off the plane, take two steps and you'd be down in an underground bunker. And we were treated like VIPs because of what, you know, we were doing. So we would, would get to be in the officer's pub or bar and, you know, one minute you're in an air, airplane almost you know, getting shot at the next thing you're in a bunker having a having a beer with uh, with the major. <laughs> it's wild. So yeah, there was there was a lot going on. And interestingly, and just to touch on this, you know, Martin and Tembu that, that Matt so admired and that we all do, he would have been up there during that time, mm. and he was with one of those commando units, you know, supporting the yeah. South African effort. So we owe him and his his. Uh, the likes of him a great deal because they played a huge part in helping to temper the, the onslaught mm. that was coming at us from, uh, from inside Angola and essentially Soviets yeah. and Cubans, thousands of them, not just because I was told that when I was in the army, but because I've researched it since then. Yeah, yeah. And it was a major conflict. Yeah, it definitely seemed like an interesting time because, you know, you were saying there's all these embargoes and pressure from the West on the race issue, but then there was also, I think, a lot of support against the Soviets in these wars as well from the, I don't know a lot about this story, but these wars, but I know, you know, the U.S. seemed to be involved anywhere the Soviets were trying to advance, (laughs) basically, so. Correct, correct. Geopolitically, South Africa was a great jewel because of its mineral resources, but because of its strategic positioning as well, Mm -hmm. and its, its natural resources. And so it was vital that the West didn't lose it to the Soviet mindset. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot at stake. And I think that, you know, rightly or wrongly, people like Thatcher and Reagan, they were adamant that that South Africa should get enough support so that, you know, we wouldn't Mm -hmm. succumb. We managed to hold out long enough to to transition into a, a, a fully democratic country, mm. thank heavens. Yeah, interesting times for sure. I'm glad that you kind of took us through some of those stories. So I guess back to when you guys were living kind of near the Kruger area, eventually you guys kind of separated and moved around the world. I know Matt's got a lot of stories about living in a lot of different places. And I guess you yeah. can kind of take it where you want, but I guess where I'm trying to get us to is, you know, Matt's told the story of, and not really knowing where he wanted to go in terms of, you know, college and things like that. He had a tennis career for a short while. And and then eventually he made this decision to go back to South Africa, which I think kind of leads us towards the road of, of telling the Rhino Man story. But I don't know if there's anything you want to fill in up to that point or maybe kind of tell that story of, you know, what that was like seeing him getting ready to go back and, and what you were feeling in that moment as well. Getting, getting ready to go back to South Africa? Yeah. That was tough. It was very, very tough. Because you were in Hawaii at the time, right? Yes. It was very tough on, on, on our children. Very, very tough. But thankfully, you know, they're both so resilient and, and smart and hardworking and diligent. I know Matt had tremendous uh, athletic and sport, uh, tennis talent. I went to see him a couple times when he was in California and, and, and I tried to support him as much as I could. I think he made the right decision to step back from the tennis, but he, he most certainly made the right decision to go back to South Africa and do what he has done. He understandably, I think most of us, certainly I went through this, you know, as, as a young man trying to figure out my path. So you try things, you, you do things, you, you make choices, you make decisions. Some of them are good and some of them aren't. But I think as long as you learn from them, 
And that's one thing that I have to say about Matt and Jess. Mm. They're fast learners. And fortunately, they found their calling. They found their purpose. And they're well on their way. So, you know, as a dad, and I, I, I know I speak for his mom, for his family, for his stepmom, for all of us, they are they're such a tribute to their family. Mm. So we're very blessed. So can you tell us when he decided to go back to South Africa, what what were your thoughts? I mean, I guess it was kind of still early in his journey, so maybe he didn't even really know where he was going. But, um, you know, he, he ended up going to the Southern African Wildlife College and studying there and getting more into conservation and connected to the rangers. And, you know, kind of watching that from afar, what was that experience like? It was a worry. But, you know, I think as a as a parent, you're always going to be concerned, not because you don't have faith in them, but simply because they're far away. And if they need you, it's hard to to just be there in five minutes. But the nature of life is is not ideal. And I knew that he had all of the uh, the prerequisites to make make a success out of out of that. And knowing how much he loved that region and wildlife and knowing what a personable person that he is, I knew that he would succeed in whatever he, he committed himself to. I also took some solace from knowing that he was out of the big cities for the most part and that he was receiving really good training. And he was very good about keeping me informed. I always knew where he was, well, most, most of the time, I thought. <laughs> But the caliber of people that he was involved with, and I did go down to see him several times, which was really wonderful to see him in that environment and how interesting how, you know, the roles had been reversed where he was now driving me around (laughs) in a Land Cruiser, showing me things and explaining things. And it was wonderful. Sometimes, you know, in the evenings out in in the African plain, watching the sun go down with a beer. Mm. And my son pointing out things, he can hear a bird call and he'll know what mm-hmm. it is. And there are thousands of birds, you know, varieties, as you know, and he'll, he'll know exactly oh, yeah. which one it is. So, yes, that, that South Africa, Southern African Wildlife College is, is a most wonderful place. I've met quite a few of the people there. Did you meet Ruben or Martin when you were there on any of those trips? Unfortunately, I didn't. I never met Martin or Ruben but I've met Anton, I met Shepard, who was involved earlier on. And, you know, just a, a number of the rangers and then also the staff at the Wildlife College that some of Matt's friends, I think you know some of them. Ash and Anel, probably, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, just, just wonderful, wonderful, solid people. So how did the song come about, Rhino Man? Talk about the early beginnings of that. At that point, yeah, so at that point, Matt was in... He was up near the Caprivi, where I had been many years before. <laughs> Very different circumstance. He was uh, finishing his master's or doing his finishing his field training as part of his master's program, and uh, that was all to do with mm-hmm. cheetahs. This is back in Namibia, right? Correct. But you know, he had already spent a lot of time at the Wildlife College. He had had trained with the Rangers. He became very uh, involved with them and with the the, the poaching situation very aware of the frightening increase in, in fatalities. And so I was all aware of this because, of course, you know, he was, he was keeping me up to speed. He would send me articles and pictures. And uh, so sometime prior, I had begun to get back into my music. Once, once we had moved over to the States, I got myself a fairly decent guitar and kind of started playing mm-hmm. it again. And started writing some, some new things. And, and, but these songs were a little different now. And then went into some of the hiatus again on the, on, the, on the music side, just with moving around. But once I was in Hawaii, I decided I was going to get back to it in a more serious way. When I was younger, when I was in Italy, I was very frustrated that I couldn't record my own stuff. Because we didn't have the technology back then where you had your own you know, mm-hmm. equipment that you could just you know, record an album quality mm-hmm. type product. You, you needed a, a recording company or a lot of money to do what you wanted to do mm-hmm. your way. And I just, you know, I didn't have that. So, I, and I didn't have, to, to be honest, I didn't have the material ready either. So I promised myself that one day I would get back to it and I would do it the way I wanted to with my songs, my stuff and all of this. 
So, yes. So once I was in a way, started getting more serious about working on some songs and some new songs came up. And also, I had always wanted to write a song for each of my children. I had written songs for other people's kids over the years, but never one for each of mine. So, of course, I started out writing a song for my daughter because it's always easier to write songs for, for girls as a guy, I think, because there's that, that contrast and, it's, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's somehow it's just easier, it was for me, because I could talk about, you know, things like butterflies and, and fairies and, and, and sunshine and mm-hmm. flowers and things like that go into a song far more easily than the hard world or the harsh world of being a game ranger. So anyway, did the song for Jess, and that, that's called Fairy Tale Skies. And then said about writing a song for Matt. Well, the first thing that came to mind was African Sun. Mm. So I thought, great, I'm onto something here, right? That'll, right, but what, 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 are, the, what are the next <laughs> words going to be? And I wanted to talk about, you know, what he was doing, his work. And even though he was specializing in, in cheetah conservation, um, and, and I I might stand to be corrected there because I don't know that he specialized in that as a conservation per se, Mm -hmm. but his field training was in cheetahs. Yeah. So, so I still, you know, was very aware of the whole rhino situation and his passion about doing something to help them. So that was the next part of the reality of the, the song I was searching for. The music came together fairly well, fairly easily. It was the words that were the big challenge. So I went back and forth. I remember sending Matt the first draft of it, and uh, he was quite excited by the by the song. And and he was still in Namibia. We were talking, you know, on a fairly regular basis. And every few days, or if, every time I came up with a new little jingle or something, a new line, I'd send it to him, and then he'd give me his feedback. And of course, he was always, "Oh, Dad, it's great. Mm. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's great." I love hearing that. But I knew that I still had a long way to go on it. But I got to thinking that it wasn't just about my African Mm -hmm. son. There were many other African sons whose parents had either lost their sons or were risking their sons because of the work they were doing. And so the song began to evolve into a more more collective theme, Mm -hmm. as it were, Uh, even though African son still features as the opening line. It evolved to embrace, you know, our African sons and daughters who are involved in this incredible work. Mm-hmm. It's very humbling to spend time with these men and women and, and see what they go through and what they risk. Mm-hmm. And you know that. You've spent time there, yeah. a lot of time, a lot more time than most people ever will. And I, I think it's just remarkable as a side note how, how you have come to be a part of this <laughs> this whole thing, a key, key component and so pivotal in helping get the story out there. Yeah. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's been a, a journey that you know, I never could have imagined from the beginning. And I feel like maybe it's kind of similar to how this song is developed. It's kind of spurred all of these things. I mean, I probably wouldn't have never gotten connected to this or Matt or any of you without the song, you know, the beginnings of this song. And I love African Sun is such a great first line because your son, and then you can expand that collectively, but also just the idea of the African sun, you know, the sun in the sky is such a, a big player when you're out there on the savannah. I mean, that's such iconic image to see the sun setting over the savannah in Kruger National Park. It is. It is. You know, and I, I try to explain that to my wife, Heather, explaining it to someone, even with a photograph, mm-hmm. and actually being there at two different things. So fortunately... You know, I was able to, we were both able to go down together and experience that with her. That's a wonderful thing to be able to experience those components, those, those snapshots of Africa uh, firsthand. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's, you cannot do it virtually. That's fortunately, I think, something that, that always has to be real. Because, you know, unless you, you are there and you're able to, use all, engage all of your senses in experiencing that, you're not getting the full mm-hmm. picture. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's one of the few places that's still wild enough that you go wander off away from the vehicle and don't know what you're doing. I mean, you're not going to last too long mm-hmm. out there, which 
in some way, I don't know, it connects you to that primal condition that we all came from and there's something special about it. So yeah, I mean, that's a big part of what this whole project is about is trying to, you know, make sure that we are able to keep those places and support the rangers that are doing the work to de- to make that happen. But how did you see the song develop over time? I mean, you you talked about the the structure of the song itself, but did you ever see this kind of <laughs> becoming part of a film and all the things that spawned after that and you know, Matt when he started GCC and it just seemed like all of this was kind of happening around the same time and you know, just kind of magically developed. Good questions at, at the beginning, you know, when Matt and I were talking about the, the song, and we were both pretty excited just how, you know, things were, were coming along with it. And I think at some point, and I remember where I was, you know, staying in Hawaii in that room that I had, where I was doing this recording, and I remember sort of getting so enthusiastic. And I said to Matt, why don't we get, you know, why don't we get a, a well-known South African singer to sing the song and maybe make a music video, you know, and, and getting all this mm. angle going, even though I, I wanted to sing it myself. <laughs> but I did reach out to a, a few people and, and never was able to make contact or heard back. Anyway, so I just decided, hey, I'm going to run with it myself. I'll hire a studio and give it my best shot. And uh, six years later, I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> so finally, it's, it's at that point. But getting back to the video thing, yes, Matt, at the time, he said, you know, it's interesting because one of the guys that I work with has a brother based in Atlanta who works for a film company, and apparently they're looking to get into the conservation business. Mm. So I thought, well, if that isn't a coincidence, I don't know what is. So that's how Matt made the connection with the free yeah. human crowd. And, you know, that, that again began to gain traction with regard to going from just a, a music video to something more substantial. And I know that that's your baby right now. And uh, I know it's in good hands. So <laughs> yeah, we're excited I excited mean, for the, the, big, the big day. Yeah, I know. We're getting really close on the film. And, and yeah, uh, that first trip, was that the trip that you, did you also come down on that one to do the, the music video recording? Or was that maybe like the second or third? I think it was the second. And I tried doing some singing with the mm-hmm. rangers because we wanted to get their voices on the song but we also wanted their visual dancing and singing yeah. you know on video so that was when i got to spend some time with them and and really get a was able to sort of take the mm-hmm. temperature of what was going on in their world yeah and i mean it's you see a little bit of it in the film but even during the training and the selection there's a lot of singing with the Rangers, which is it's really special to. They love yeah. singing. They yeah. love singing, and actually, that's one thing that I, one of many things I wanted to you know get into the song was their their sense mm-hmm. of joy and purpose. Yeah, I mean, I think you really managed to achieve that sense of you know the chorus and the 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 backup vocals in the current version that's going to be in the film as well. It just has that collective feel and there's a lot of, you know, I think the song is this blend between the pain of the reality of the situation, but then the hope and the joy of the the people involved looking towards the future mm. and what can be done. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about it, just this final version, the, the polished version that you're releasing and that's going to be in the film and how that all kind of came to finality, I guess. <laughs> yes. So... I got the first real studio recording in Hawaii, but t- it turned out that it, it just didn't have the components that, that I was looking for. The sound, the uh, sentiment wasn't quite there. And, you know, you can edit and re-edit so many times, but, you know, if it looks like a duck, etc., etc. So, and we didn't want it to sound like a duck. So some years later, you know, in Michigan, began to think about okay, time to re-record this and do it properly or do it differently. And through a good friend of mine, who's also a, a relative uh, on Heather's side of family, Heather's niece's husband, Adam Fitzgerald, he heads up Underflow Records. And he's got a wonderful you know, musical pedigree and, and has been in bands and, and very successful. 
he put me in touch with some people, Jeff Yateman and Jeff and some of his musical friends, uh, really, really am- amazingly helpful in getting a, a good mm. bass, a good recording done. And then moved on to just getting a final edit and a few modifications, made a few changes to lyrics with the help of Michael King and his studio here in in Birmingham in Michigan. And another amazing musician and voice coach and singer, Laurie Frick, she also gave a lot of valuable input. So it's been a very collaborative effort. Additionally, the, the musicians and then the lady singers that you'll hear, the harmonies. And then I'd always wanted there to be children's voices in the song, just because children's voices are so unique and they, they bring a lot of hope and optimism. And I, I wanted that to be in there. And I, you know, I originally wanted, it to, wanted everyone to be from mm-hmm. Africa. Well, with COVID and what have you, it's not, you know, it hasn't all been possible. But what really matters is that I think I could say this is a, a, an international production and that we've got people from around the world and across this country. And, you know, I I hope that if nothing else, it will at least just make people excited about what a rhino, how important a rhino is. Because if people don't think of of rhinos or nature and other species being important, then then what is important? Can you imagine if just, just hummingbirds vanished off the face of the earth? What a loss that would be. Just because an animal is big or small, that's irrelevant. It's, it's a, a species that, that is irreplaceable. And I think, you know, if everyone can find a positive purpose, a constructive purpose and get involved in it, other than just making money to pay the rent, the world could, you know, begin to transform pretty quickly. We just need leadership. And when leaders are courageous and they're able to stand up and say, hey, we've got to do this because it's the right thing to do. Not because it's easy or convenient or because it's going to make money or make me look good, but we can really encourage people to to just dig a little deeper and say, hey, what floats my boat? What's out there? There's got to be something, something I can bring my talent or ability to and and help you know improve the situation. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love how the song, it kind of starts out people know the story it kind of starts out about your son but then also rangers but then by the end you know it's we are the rhino warriors so it's it kind of includes everyone and then you have all these voices which just yeah it kind of brings everyone into the spirit of you know we need to save this species correct i mean think of something comes to mind you know like a, a boxer the boxer is the the visual he's the visible guy you see him in the ring you remember his name you know what he looks like but he needs a trainer, he needs support, he needs protection, he, you know, he needs medical people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever role you have to play in helping a species or a cause, it doesn't matter how visual or not visual or important or not important you think you are or aren't. What matters is, is, making a, is adding something. Every little bit counts. Yeah especially when the stakes are this high. What, what's the line, I should know this, but what's the line towards the end of the song that's in, is it Zulu or Tsonga? Where Malembe is rhino, correct? Yeah. So you would have to speak to your expert friend, and I should know offhand, but because of the different iterations and things, I couldn't say with 100% certainty. But I think it is Shangan, yeah, which is, they speak Chitsonga, so yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but it means we are the rhino warriors. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, I love the way that song fades out. And yeah, so you're, you're going to be releasing it, or it is released when this comes out, this podcast. And it's also going to be in the film Rhino Man, which we're hoping to release soon. <laughs> so it's been amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you feel this on the song side, but... I've been involved in the film for what, about four years now, and it started about three years before that. And I feel like so many times along the way, we're like, oh yeah, we're about a month away from being done with this thing. And <laughs> here we are years later, but it really is coming to that point where all of these magical things have come together and so many people have been involved in so many different ways. And you know, with the film, we've managed to have an amazing Dutch artist, uh, Marcel Van Lewe, to create a poster and then 
Sipa Mkunu and yeah, Mendisa Dvanga um, have come on to sing on our title track as well. So yeah, it's it's been pretty wild to see how many people have come together to make this thing a reality. And it all started with a song, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, you know, however it's helped, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be part of it and um, very humbled at the same time. I, I keep thinking there's always something, you know, you want to improve. There's always something you could do better. But that's the nature mm -hmm. of it. It's what keeps us going. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I could feel you. I, there's probably never going to be a day when I'm completely satisfied with everything in the film either. But yeah, I, I think you just get it as good as you can to a point and then it's got to go out into the world and make a difference. So Correct. Oh, and I think you've done that. Mm, thank you. Yeah, this has been a great conversation. Is there anything else you want to leave us with before we get a little taste of the song? Goodness. I think just going back to, you know, how important it is to unite behind a common purpose in this day and age to try and find people that we, we can look up to and feel that we can trust and feel comfortable with and passionate about the cause that they're promoting, I, I think that can really help make the world a better mm. place. Well put. Thanks so much, Paul. And yeah, everyone go check out Rhino Man the Song on Spotify and everywhere else that you can find music. We'll definitely be promoting it in our channels. But yeah, could you give us a little taste of the song as we roll out on this episode? Excellent, John. I will. Son, you watch over the night Find those last hero who's willing to fight Searching the shadows on these African plains To turn this tide on poaching of the rhinos being slain The rhino man listens for the telltale sound Poachers coming closer to cut another rhino down. And if just one more heartless act is all that it takes to kill the pride of a nation, it tragically will. This is our Africa, her soul is not the same. The rhino is a part of us and needs us to prevail, for we are Africa. Will not deny her place in this world. So we rise up to take a stand beside the Rhino Man. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast.